All right, so this is First and Second Peter, a message for today's church from Peter the Apostle. This is lesson number one in that series. The title of this particular lesson, The Meaning of Grace, Part One. And uh, as far as the text is concerned today, we're going to cover First Peter chapter one, verses one to 12. So you, be, uh, you can be taking out your Bibles and looking at that. Uh, before we look at the text of 1st and 2nd Peter, I'd like to uh, provide a little bit of information about Peter the Apostle himself. Of all the Apostles, we probably know the most about him. And then after this introductory uh, material, we'll uh, examine the main theme of the first letter, which is the true meaning and power of God's grace in Christ, uh, in Christ Jesus. So uh, Peter is unique, actually, uh, among the Apostles because he had a diverse life for a man of humble origins. Uh, there were four important phases to his life. The first was Peter as the successful fisherman. He lived in Capernaum where Jesus also lived as an adult. We know that from Mark 1.21. He and his brother Andrew had a fishing business together. He was married, he had children. Uh, we know this because he served as an elder. 1 Peter 5.1. And uh, his mother-in-law lived with him, which was not unusual for that time. Uh, families uh, lived uh, together, extended families. Also, uh, he was, he was uh, Peter the successful fisherman. He was Peter the disciple of Jesus. Peter knew Jesus because they lived in the same town <clears throat> and was introduced by his brother Andrew to Jesus. Uh, and his brother Andrew was a disciple of John the Baptist. So there, there are the connections. His brother is a disciple of John the Baptist. John the Baptist leaves, uh, leads Andrew to Jesus. Andrew brings his brother. You know, it's all connected. Um, Peter had both uh, high and low moments in his, um, uh, uh, in his um, life as a disciple of Jesus. Um, he uh, observed miracles. He performed miracles. That's a pretty high point. He was present at the transfiguration of Jesus. That's a pretty remarkable experience. He saw, unfortunately, the death of Jesus, but was a witness also to his resurrection. Again, a pretty high point in his life as a disciple. But he had low points as well. He was reprimanded by Jesus for suggesting even that Jesus avoid the cross. You know, that's, you know get thee behind me, Satan. That, that was a pretty tough, uh, pretty tough rebu uh, rebuke for Peter. Uh, we know also that he denied knowing Jesus, you know, the betrayal three times he denied knowing Jesus. Interesting that all four evangelists mention Peter's denial of Jesus. All four of them record that particular uh, event, a very low point in his life. Uh, so you've got Peter, the successful fisherman, disciple of Jesus. He was also a church leader. Paul says that along with James and John, Peter was a pillar uh, or leader in the early church. He was the first to preach the gospel, Acts chapter 2, uh, and preach the gospel to many of the people who had you know, actually been complicit in Jesus' crucifixion. And so you know, Peter preached the gospel to them first time. He stood up to the Jewish leaders who threatened him in order to be quiet. And he didn't, uh, you know, he didn't back down, Acts 3 and 4. He also stood up to those in the church who wanted to keep the Gentiles out of the church, Acts chapter 15. So uh, you, you see him in his role as church leader um, af after the departure of Christ. And then Peter as the author. Uh, he was uh, uneducated in the sense that he didn't have the kind of training that the scribes had. He wasn't stupid, but he didn't have that kind of training. He didn't go to rabbinical school. Uh, his writing style is simple when compared to the others, but the idea is profound. Some people believe that Mark's gospel, for example, is actually Peter's account of his experiences with Jesus dictated to Mark. And Mark is writing down what Peter is feeding him, and the net result was the gospel of Mark. Uh, he did write two letters under his name, perhaps more, but we know of two that he wrote under his own name, First and Second Peter, and he wrote them to the same group. Uh, those people were uh, in Asia Minor, today we call that country Turkey. Around 64, 65 AD, uh, near the end of his life, he wrote these things. 
Uh, he died in Rome, crucified upside down because he refused to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord, and so he, they crucified him upside down. 67 AD, fulfilling Jesus' prophecy about him when Jesus talked about how he would eventually be martyred in John 21, 18. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It's interesting that many study the book of Romans, for example, or the book of Galatians to learn about the subject of God's grace. And this is okay, since in these two letters, the theory and the benefits of God's grace are well explained in the book of Romans, in the book of uh, Galatians. But it is in the book of Peter, the Peter's first letter especially, that we see what grace produces in a person's life. A life like Peter's, that is a mixture of good and bad, success and failure. You know, your life, my life. You know. In Peter's writings we find how grace affects the ordinary person. That's my point. So hopefully by the end of our uh, study uh, we will have a greater understanding not only of what God's grace means, you know, unmerited favor and so on and so forth, the definition of grace, but we're going to actually see what it produces in a person's life. But before we do that, we need to first deal with some incorrect and inaccurate ideas of grace that a lot of people believe, unfortunately. So we start with what grace is not, what it isn't. And when we mention the word grace to people, many times it conjures up different things to them some of the things uh, that they say or think about the subject of grace are just not biblical. For example, some people see grace as a form of liberalism. You know, some think that grace means that you can do what you want to do because as a saved person, God will not let you be lost and because you're under grace. You know, you're under grace, you do what you want. Of course, this is unbiblical because Paul in Romans 6.1 says, shall we continue in sin that grace may increase? May it never be. So Paul says that grace is not an excuse to continue sinning without guilt or consequence. Don't use grace as an excuse to just keep on doing what you're doing. So those who are under grace are not free to continue to sin. Because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, or the wage of sin is death, Romans 6.23. So grace is, is not liberalism. Some people think that grace is permissiveness. People who believe that grace means that when it comes to you, God's child, God doesn't care about sin. He's blind to your sin because of grace. In other words, grace, uh, with this mindset, uh, makes God into some sort of indulgent grandfather who says, oh, boys will be boys, you know. Human beings are weak. He's a tolerant God. But the Bible says, see, that's the problem. You, know, you hold up that idea and then you hold it up against the Bible and you've got to go with what the Bible says. The Bible says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad, 2 Corinthians 5.10. Does that sound like a permissive God to you? Doesn't sound like a permissive God to me. So grace does not mean that God ignores or indulges, uh, indulges our sins. Not a single one. I knew a fellow once who was a, you know, a very pretty devout Christian, but he was a smoker. And, uh, and we talked about that and, and I asked him about that uh, and, and he said that God permitted him this vice because he was under a lot of pressure. I figure, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever works for you, you know, but that, that's how he justified it. You know, I mean, God is gracious to me. He, he, let, he lets it slide. He lets this thing slide, you know, because I'm under a lot of pressure. I got a lot of work and this is the thing that helps me, you know, helps me get through, relaxes me. You know, of course, it also poisons you, uh, gives you cancer and so on and so forth, but you know, why quibble? Uh, number three, 
What grace is not? It's not worldliness. Again, some people think that grace is a, a special permission that they have from God to simply remain in the world. By grace, they're going to heaven. So in the meantime, they can just be part of this world till it's time to go. In other words, no effort at holy living, no effort at spiritual growth, no effort at building the kingdom. These are the people who just you know, clock in, clock in, clock out, you know, church wise, prayer wise. But the Bible clearly indicates that those who are saved by grace are also transformed by that grace into something different. And we'll, that, that's what Peter really talks about in his epistle. Paul the Apostle says that Christians produce spiritual fruit, love and joy and patience and kindness and faithfulness, as well as self-control, so on and so forth. So grace does not excuse us from living a holy and pure and fruitful and faithful life. It actually promotes it and permits it in our life. And then the other one I like is uh, premeditation. Well, I, when I say I like. The worst and most dangerous misconception about grace is that you can play around with it and use it to your advantage. Very dangerous. The most dangerous game in the spiritual world is presuming on God's grace. In other words, thinking you can sin now and enjoy that because later on God's grace will cover your tracks and actually having that mindset. You know, grace is not something that we use to enjoy sinfulness. When we do this, we don't realize that the net effect of this type of thinking is that it hardens our conscience to the point where we can't repent. We don't even know how anymore. This is what the Hebrew writer is talking about in Hebrews 6, you know, uh, verses 4 to 8, where he ends up and he says, where we cannot be renewed again to repentance. He's talking about hardening of the heart, people that play around with with grace. So liberalism and permissiveness and worldliness and premeditation, these are some of the things that grace is not. So let look at, let's look at Peter's epistle and after reviewing his introduction, we're going to see the first thing that grace really is. So let's first of all read verse 1, 1 Peter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, who are, who are chosen, who are chosen. So Peter introduces himself first. In those days, letters were the reverse of what letters are today. Today you go, dear Joe, and blah, 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 how's it going? You know, your friend Mike. In those days, it was the reverse. Uh, hello, this is Mike, blah, 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 blah. Uh, hope you're doing well, Joe. So you know, they introduced themselves at the top rather than at the, rather than at the end. And so he immediately establishes his uh, credibility and authority as not just any apostle, I'm not just any messenger, he says, but I'm a messenger chosen specifically by Christ himself. So you know, that, that establishes his authority for what he's going to be saying later on. The letter is directed to churches that are scattered throughout Asia Minor, as I said today, Turkey, and would be passed around among them upon reception. Verse two, he says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. So he offers a blessing upon them. And he gives the reason why they should receive this blessing. The blessing is that grace and peace be upon them in full measure. That's the blessing. Now the reason for them to have access to this is fourfold. And, and I'll give it to you in reverse order, okay? Four reasons. Four reasons why they should receive the, this blessing uh, uh, completely. First of all, Jesus died and shed His blood to wash away their sins. Secondly, they obeyed the gospel in repentance and baptism to access this blood of Christ. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit has filled them and continues to work in them. And fourthly, 
God knew from the beginning that all those who would accept Jesus would have these blessings. That's why they, that's why they should enjoy this blessing of grace and peace to its fullest measure because of all these reasons. Jesus obtained it for him. They obeyed the gospel. The spirits inside of them. God knew that he would be blessing them. For all those reasons, they should enjoy that blessing. And interesting that he links the death of Christ to the sprinkling, sprinkling of blood of the sacrifice by the high priest, right? Have a branch of hyssop and, and the blood of the animal and everything would be sprinkled with blood. The altar, the, everything would be sprinkled with blood, signifying a purification. Well, he's saying we've been sprinkled with blood, signifying our uh, purification. So he prays that the blessings of grace and peace as a result of their salvation through Jesus, known and promised by God, would result in them experiencing the joy of grace and peace. Now in the next verses, he's going to explain that one of the joys and meanings of this grace that he wishes upon them is security. In other words, he wants them to experience grace, okay? He wants them to experience grace and joy. And the question might be, well, what am I supposed to be feeling? You know, you want me to have this grace, but what, could, you give, could you break it down for me? What exactly am I supposed to be feeling here? And Peter says, well, what you're supposed to be feeling, first of all, is security, assurance, a feeling of being safe. That's one feeling that you should have if you have the grace of, the grace of God. Okay. So in verses three to five, Peter explains that since salvation and the grace that flows from it comes from God, it is secure. It's secure. So let's read verse three. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it was God's plan to save us through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. We know that. Then he says, salvation and its accompanying grace is not a human invention. It's a godly thing. It's God's plan, it's God's thing that He's giving you. We need to keep that in mind as we read verses four and five. He says, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So, because it comes from God, the salvation comes from God. Because it comes from God, it is a powerful thing and it's a sure thing, okay? The inheritance that he's talking about, if you want to break it down, what's, what is my inheritance? Well, the inheritance is a glorified body. When we resurrect, we'll have a different body. The Bible kind of refers to it as a glorified body. That's the inheritance, that's the thing that we're going to get a glorified body, and eternal life, okay? Not only eternal length, you know, lengthwise eternal, but the quality of it is going, to be, uh, is going to be eternal. This gift, right? Glorified body, eternal life. This gift, given through grace, meaning because of God's favor, this gift is sure and will not be destroyed, unlike a material inheritance. A man or a woman or a man and a woman, they work all their lives and they work hard and they build up a business and they make a lot of money and so on and so forth, millionaires, and they pass and they leave all of their money and all of the business and everything you know, they leave to their children. It doesn't always happen this way, but we've seen it happen, right? And the children inherit the money and what do they do with it? They just, psh, they just go through it like water in five years, the whole thing is gone. Well, Peter is saying here, this inheritance, this glorified body thing and this eternal life thing, this is an absolute sure thing. This will not decay. Not only is it sure, but the quality of it is such that it can never be destroyed. And this thing that you're waiting for will be revealed when? Well, at the resurrection when Jesus returns. 
Okay, so now he says, I want you to really you know, get a full measure of this grace and peace. And you say back, well, what am I supposed to be feeling? Well, one of the feelings you're supposed to be feeling is security. Security for what? Well, security in the knowledge that the thing that you're going to get, your glorified body, your eternal life, is a sure thing. It will never be destroyed and it's there waiting for you when Jesus returns. Why? Because God is the one who's giving it to you, that's why. So we go, verse six, he says, in this you greatly rejoice, right? Now that you understand what I've just explained to you, he says, in this you greatly rejoice. Even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And though you do not see Him now, but believe in Him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. So this sure gift is the cause of rejoicing. And uh, also the cause of your happy anticipation. You ever see a little kid, their birthday party's on Saturday and it's Monday? Oh, my party is Saturday and on Tuesday morning. Mommy, my party is on Saturday, Wednesday morning. Mommy, when's my party? Oh, it's Saturday. You know what I'm saying? Happy anticipation. Well, he's saying, you know, uh, this sure gift is the cause of rejoicing and happy anticipation. However, he says, in the meantime, there may be suffering involved while you wait for it. And remaining faithful while you wait for this gift of grace does several things. First, it confirms the genuineness of your faith. If a person endures while the going is rough, it demonstrates that their faith is real, not just talk. You know, James 3.18, you show me your faith by what you say, I'll show you my faith by what I do. So I'm anticipating and I'm rejoicing and I'm feeling secure that this thing that God has promised me is going to come. I know it's going to come. Nobody can destroy it. But in the meantime, stuff happens. <laughs> My house burns down. I get a cold, uh, you know, whatever. Stuff happens. And if I maintain that happy anticipation, if I maintain that faith while stuff happens, it's simply a witness that my faith is a real faith. It's genuine. Secondly, it honors Christ. Your suffering and patience is a demonstration of love and loyalty to the Lord, and this genuinely honors Him as your Lord. What does Paul say in Romans 12, 1, right? We offer, our, what do we offer? You know, I'm offering my friend's body as a living sacrifice. No, no, you know, Paul says, I'm offering what? My body. Offer your body, my body, as a living sacrifice. Living sacrifice. This is how we honor Christ. Thirdly, he says it, gener it generates joy and love in you. Jesus said, blessed or happy are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verse 10. Well, this behavior demonstrates that they really belong. How do you know you belong in the kingdom? Well, Peter is saying, well, you know you belong in the kingdom when you suffer trials and the trials that you suffer actually produce joy in you rather than despair. That's how you know you're one of us. The world, people of no faith, they don't get that. They're only happy when good things happen. Christians manage to be happy when good things happen and they manage to maintain faith and joy even when bad things happen. Suffering righteously for the Lord produces happiness. Well, that's completely upside down. Since when does suffering produce joy? Well, it doesn't, except in the kingdom. In the kingdom, suffering righteously for the Lord produces happiness. It is a natural reaction for the spiritual person. Number four, he says, it also guarantees salvation. A proven faith results in a secure hope of salvation which produces peace and joy in one's, in one's heart. 
And so Peter tells his readers that grace means feeling sure. How should I feel if I'm under grace? Well, I'm not feeling you know, liberality to sin. I'm not feeling permissiveness. I'm not feeling that I can be in the world without cause. That's not what I'm feeling. He says, if you're under the power of grace and you're experiencing the grace of God in your life, the thing, the emotion you should be feeling is security. I feel sure about my, salva uh, my salvation. Even though there are times when one's faith is tested, continuing in faith will only strengthen that hope and increase the joy. You know how Christians say, you can beat me up, you can, you can whip me, you can throw me in jail, you can even threaten to kill me, I cannot deny what I know. I can't deny what I know. What I know is true. You can't beat it out of me. So if you're going to kill me, go ahead and do it. Because it's impossible for me to deny the thing that I know. So he finishes off verses 10 to 12. He says, as to this salvation, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful searches and inquiries, seeking to know what person or time the spirit of Christ within them was indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you in these things which now have been announced to you through those who preach the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. What's he saying? Well, he's saying in the last, in these last three verses of the section, he compares them, you know, the people he's writing to, he compares them to two other groups in order to show how secure they are in Christ. He compares them first to the prophets who spoke from God, who did miracles, who counseled kings, who saved the nation over and over again. And he compares them also to angels who are mighty beings who dwell at the throne of God. And his point is this, both these groups, the prophets and the angels, both these groups did not receive the revelation about God's gracious plan to save men through faith in Jesus Christ and give them glorious bodies and allow them to live forever with Christ in heaven. This thing that you have that is sure, the glorified body, the eternal life, neither the prophets nor the angels were allowed to know this thing. All they knew is that whatever they were doing, they were serving someone in the future and you are the ones, you are the ones that they, were, that they were serving. So even though they were mighty servants who searched for the answers, all they knew was that God's plan was to serve people in the future. And you know what? You ever wonder, where am I in the Bible? This is where you and me, this is where we are in the Bible. We're the people that the angels and the prophets served. Why? Because the gift has been revealed to us. The glorified body, the eternal life, the promise that's sure. We're the ones that have received that promise in our generation today. So God's grace, the author is saying, Peter is saying, God's grace, it's no afterthought. It was planned for and it was passed on carefully throughout the ages until the right time to reveal it to the world so all could take advantage of it. So, Peter begins his epistle by explaining that the grace of God is a sure thing. And when we think of his grace, in other words, his favor towards us, we can, you know, the thing that we ought to be feeling and experiencing is security. Grace equals security because, one, it comes from God. When a promise of blessing comes directly from God, you can be absolutely sure. That's security. That's security. You know, when I was a kid, my, my, uh, my mom and dad said, if, if, you, uh, if you get you know, A's and spelling and so on and so on, we'll buy you a bike. We'll buy you a bicycle. Well, you know what? I didn't have the bike, but it's like I had it already. 
I was already you know, thinking of the streamers. Remember the streamers you'd put in the handlebars? You know, I was already thinking of the streamers and I was always thinking I'm going to put a bell on it, maybe go crazy and put one of those electronic buzzers, you know what I'm saying? Remember you said put batteries in there? I mean, it's like I had it already. That's when your mom and dad promises to do something, I mean, it's like a sure thing. And then when the day came and much to their surprise, I did get A's and everything. They tried to talk me out of getting the bike and tried to buy me off with money. No, because they, you know, because they were afraid, you know, oh, a bike is going to be out in the street. He might get hurt and blah, blah, blah. You know, oh no, I wasn't having none of it. You said you're getting a bike. I want a bike. And they got me a bike. With God, there is no last minute wavering. <laughs> There's no change of plans with him. If he's promised us this thing, we can be absolutely sure uh, that it will happen. Secondly, this promise grows stronger. This confidence grows stronger with adversity. The promise of grace itself cannot be diminished by trials. The harder you struggle to remain faithful, the more it produces in terms of joy and hope and security. It's really, it's the reverse of how things work in the world. Thirdly, this promise has lasted throughout the ages. Long ago, angels and prophets handed it down and passed it to us, and we receive it today. And the grace of God in forgiving us and granting us eternal life is as fresh and motivating as it was 4,000 years ago when God announced it to Abraham. We're still motivated by it. Grace means security. Security in God's uh, desire and His ability to fulfill His promise to bless us now and to save us forever. So we sometimes, you know, we sometimes doubt or we're afraid of the past or we're afraid of the future, but God's grace has wiped away the past with Jesus' blood. And God has guaranteed us the future with Jesus' resurrection. You know, some people say, well, we need to live in the moment. We, leave, we need to live in the now. And, and, and people don't know how to do that. How do I live in the now? How do I get there psychologically or spiritually? Well, the way you get there is you recognize that your past has been taken care of by the blood of Christ on the cross and your future has been taken care of by His resurrection. That's why you don't have to worry about the past catching up to you and you don't have to worry about the future not being what it was promised because Jesus rose from the dead. So if I'm not concerned about the past and I'm not worried about the future, I can live in the, I can live in the now. Well, in the weeks to come, we'll continue with other meanings of grace, but for now, we're going to remain with the idea of security. If you have received the grace of God through Christ, you can be absolutely sure of your eternal salvation. Do not be afraid to go through whatever trials you need to in order to remain faithful. It will be worth it. Remember what I said many times, Jesus' promise. It won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. That's our first lesson in 1st and 2nd Peter. Thank you for your attention.